the object of Taxi Chronicles to sell our real riders with real stories, share their experience and enhance your life. So sit back and enjoy the journey. Morning, morning, morning. Yes, we're back with another episode, another rider. Today we have an interesting guy all the way from Afghan or Russia, however you see it. You will find out surely enough. And he's going to tell us about his ancestral life story and his story and give us an insight into stuff about Afghanistan that I never knew. And you know I'm a lover of history. So nice to have you here today, Billy. Thank you. It's nice to have you as a driver. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> so Vinny, we have to start a recap a bit. Tell us the story, you're half Russian, half Afghan. Yeah, correct. Okay, so tell us, just recap on what you told me earlier about the history of Afghan, why the Russians moved in, and where your grandparents come into play. So, right as the war started, and my mother's side and my father's side, they were basically working together against the terrorists in Afghanistan. And long story short, after many, many years of fighting against them, my father's side, his dad. So, who was the terrorist? Just the Taliban, basically. Oh, it was the Taliban, okay. Yeah. The Tal was it Mujahideen? It wasn't Mujahideen. Yeah, the Mujahideen, basically. So, it was Mujahideen there. So, Russia had moved in yeah. already. No, sorry, so just going back a bit, you said there was an empire. Yeah. The modern Afghan. Yeah, so the. Basically, before the Mujahideen and everything took over, Afghanistan was very modernized. It would be no different than any European country. So the traditional clothing and stuff that you see nowadays that they're wearing, and the way that the women are like veiled up and stuff, that wasn't really a thing like around back then. Mm -hmm. So when the Mujahideen moved in and started taking over and taking control, then things started to change, obviously because of fear and control. And, and uh, this was before the Russians moved in? Yeah. Okay. And around the, that second time as well, so th this was carried on. But um, why why did the regime change? You know what? I don't think it's changed at all because <laughs> it's still going on till this day. <laughs> no, I mean when I say the regime, where the where everything was modern and everything was really pleasant, what oh, happened to religion, that? Religion, religion, of course. So because, so, uh, because Afghanistan is, uh, even though it's in Asia, even though it's in, in Asia, it's it was still a Muslim country. So the Mujahideen were like, this is a Muslim country, we need to follow a specific law and, and everything. Mm. But before all of that, even though they were Muslim, they were still like modernized, you know? Mm -hmm. Like kind of like Turkey and all these other countries you see. When you go there, you don't see mm. them wearing, they, you see them wearing modernized clothes and stuff, yeah. you know, suits and whatever. Mm -hmm. So all of that happened, but I don't know too much of the history of that. Okay. Stuff, but so, in depth at least. Yeah, so back to the part you said your grandparents was fighting on the Russian side against Mujahideen. Yeah, so both of my grandfathers were generals. One was uh, a general in the Russian military and the other one was a general in the Afghan military. But on my Afghan side, my father's and father basically was in control of like the special forces back then. Okay. In Kandahar. Oh. So he went to battle with the soldiers because he didn't want to leave them to just go in. He said it would set a bad example. He ended up dying. Okay. And once he died, my mother's side, because uh, my grandfather on my mother's side as well, they were working together. They became friends after like many years of just like having this joint operation. So he took my father to Czechoslovakia. Back then it was Czech Republic. And when he took him over there, he put him in university and everything. He got his PhD and multiple years after all of that happened he ended up getting married to my mom which was the daughter obviously mm -hmm. so you're born in uh, in Russia yeah correct your dual nationality or dual heritage in that um, sense well technically I would be but <laughs> when I came to this country it was pretty hard to keep a Russian and a British passport at the same time oh is it yeah because obviously because of like the conflict and everything even back then you know but so so wait a minute I didn't know that so they said you can't have a Russian passport yeah so I had to surrender my Russian passport basically and the only way for you to keep it is to go through like a lot of like basically just a lot of trouble and yeah, I didn't and, know they yeah, do that through the embassy it's, it's still possible but obviously it's just too long the process is very very long and complicated oh. so 
that's very prejudiced that is yeah <laughs> well, well it, why would I have thought it is because it's <laughs> things have obviously changed now oh they've changed now yeah so it's uh, not quite the same oh, I thought you were talking like recently nah no no this is 1999 when I came here okay so back then I had to basically surrender my Russian passport but 1999 uh, the Cold War had ended, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, it ended in ninety one. Ninety two, yeah. yeah. Oh, ninety two. Yeah. Okay. And that's when Ukraine was created as well. All right. So, so what was life like growing up in Russia? Honestly, I, I like from an honest point of view, because I still work here. If you work in Russia, you have money, and you can put food on the table. If you don't work, you don't get benefits or anything. So you basically suffer if you don't work. So when you say benefits, what, what do you mean? If you don't have a job here, for example, now you have like universal credit, the job seekers allowance and everything, right? Whereas in Russia, you don't have that. And the only benefits that I'm aware of that you do have and you did have were, if you have children, you get money for that. So the more children that you have, the more money you get. So there's lots of people with lots of children then? Yeah, for the most part. Oh, okay. Did you feel part of, do you, you feel part, do you feel fully Russian or do you feel like there's um, no racism or anything like that? No, no to be honest with you, I mean, uh, the, there, there's loads of uh, Russian Muslims and stuff, to be honest with you. There's Russian Jews, Russian Muslims, then there's Orthodox Christian Russians. So it's, Russia's like pretty diverse as well, but obviously the, the Muslims are towards the Caucasus side, where Dagestan and Chech, uh, Chechnya is. Okay. So, even even back then, even though back then when I was born in 1992, around then and, and even up until the late 90s, there was a war with the Chechens and everything, which were the Muslims. But now they're basically perfectly fine and, and all cool with each other mm. after loads of like fighting. But what was the war with the Chechens about? To be honest, with you, I don't even know too much about that. But it was quite complicated. I haven't really looked into the history of it. It's interesting to what you say because. You always kind of get the perception through the news that Russia is very racist, prejudiced and all this other stuff. I know you shouldn't really listen to the BBC, but that's the kind of perception you have. Yeah, exactly. That's what you're told at least, right? Yeah, it's really bad. I know they haven't been keen on black people. That's all not many people are. <laughs> <laughs> I do <don't> well <laughs> in that respect. That Surprisingly, be... the only country in the world right now that's actually fully helping out the African regions are the Russians right now. Because right. the majority of NATO, whenever they go over there for quote unquote peacekeeping operations, they go there to basically take the resources, uh -huh. where it's diamonds and minerals and rocks and whatever else they can get. Uh -huh. Whereas the Russians right now, they're, they're over there pushing out NATO. They've been there for like a few years now since since they went into Syria when America went yeah. in there. Okay. So they're they're qu uh, pretty close with them. The Africans are pretty like close with Russia now. Yeah, I hear, I hear. So what's what do you what do you have a take on the Russia Ukraine situation? Honestly, from from what, what perspective? From like my perspective, or from like just You're, the countries? Well, but you, well, let's say both. Okay. Well. Realistically, if you look at the history of Ukraine, like I said, it's only been around since 92. And basically, Ukraine is basically Russia, even though they don't want to admit it. If you ask the old school, mm. the older generation in Ukraine, who you're going to side with, whether it's like a country like the UK, for example, or a country like Russia, over 80% of them would say we're Russian. Mm -hmm. We want to go and join Russia again, which is why the wars turned out the way that it has. A lot of the people that surrendered ended up going towards the Russian border instead of the Polish border because there's not much to do when you go to the Polish border then you have to go through like God knows how many months and years before you're a citizen of whatever country you end up in, right? Mm. Whereas you had the option at the beginning of the war, Putin said, if you want to come over to Russia, you're Russians by nationality and by heritage, you're more than welcome to come. We'll, we'll give you passports and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of the Russians ended up, well, the Ukrainians ended up going back to Russia, the older generation at least. Mm -hmm. But the younger generation were obviously westernized because Ukraine's very close with America and NATO and the UK. So the younger generation decided to go towards the Polish border so they could basically come and find a quote unquote better new, uh, and a new life. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I, 
it, it, it was it, it was inevitable it was it was bound to happen but the media just twisted everything apart like with the way that they were just handing over weapons to ukraine and with all these like labs and stuff that they were finding that were like funded by the american government and everything when you say labs what kind of labs like the covid labs where they were building and creating pathogens and viruses oh is it yeah okay. a lot of them and obviously you won't see that like you said on the bbc and everything where they have all the reports and everything find that they find reports and papers and whatever yeah. it in the embassies and stuff that they found that they couldn't like burn in time because that's when they came over obviously ukraine kiev was hard to invade because it's, it's the city and it's closer towards the polish border but the eastern flank was a bit more like difficult for them to maintain so they obviously had to run and, and a lot of files and everything were left mm. okay how, how how do you think it's all going to pan out if if it, if it keeps going the way that it is i think that one part of russia i mean ukraine like the western part is going to end up siding with poland and poland's going to take their part and they're going to take it into their own country and the eastern part's just going to turn into russia again they're just going to annex it both parts are going to annex it and everyone's going to take whatever they can take what side is the oil on you know that's a good question i have no idea because that would the, be the, the, the pipeline does run through ukraine i believe yeah because what i'm thinking is that's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back in the sense of if it's in the east then the russians say yeah we'll just keep the east either if way it's the, in the west then the russians will say no yeah no. either way the pipelines are in in the in the control of russia and if if they have the gas and they enable it for you to have then obviously you'll be able to get it but if you don't then they'll just keep it for themselves unless you pay them so like with, with what's happening right now obviously the weather's not too cold yet so we haven't really used too much electricity and heating and uh, and whatever else that we would use right if it was to be like raining constantly with mm -hmm. the weather being like a lot less humid and whatnot so we haven't really actually fully experienced that cold winter yet but i'd say around towards the end of october maybe or mid-october when it starts to get cold and it starts to get icy that's when it's going to hit like western europe really really hard mm. so we'll see but I mean, so it'd be like with the germans when they they you can come into the country very quickly but you're going to get frozen out yeah which is pretty much what's going to happen here i think because the russians said if you're going to sanction us and uh, not not allow us to like get paid in in uh, British pounds or euros or US dollars from whichever country is getting oil from them or whatever they get from them then mm -hmm. we're going to ask you to pay us in rubles and the UK is definitely not going to convert their British pounds into rubles and then pay them mm. because that would just be a bigger loss for them what is interesting is that somebody I heard someone talking and it made me think Russia's got China and India on their side and Saudi Arabia now the United Arab Emirates. So they're gonna win yeah, because when it comes they've to got resources. the manuf. Think about it, they've got resources. And they've mean, got the manufacturing they hubs. If you think about it. They've got the manufacturing hubs of the world, and then they're in good relations with most of the African countries. And they they've got a large amount of the resources for food, for grain and everything, yeah. which makes it even more difficult. Well, they can just they've got a big country. They can start doing more agriculture anyway. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. part of the world's like really friendly when it comes to like natural foods and everything. Yeah. So yeah, that thing. So I don't see Putin not winning. No, it's it's almost impossible for for them to lose. And the main reason why uh, NATO couldn't fully go into that part of the world with like their jets and everything is because Eastern Europe is basically Eastern Europe. Like, how many of those Eastern European countries have Russian anti-air defense missiles? If you go into, for example, if America was to fly one of their F-35 jets, which is their fifth uh, generation jet, into Ukraine, for example, to offer like air support, it wouldn't last long. Mm. It would literally be shot down within like minutes, if that. Like all of the packages that the the support packages that they were sending, which weren't food to Ukraine, <laughs> mm. which was just weapons, they were all getting shot as soon as they were uh, crossing the Polish border into Ukraine, and then the Russians would take them. And then once they would take them, they would basically reverse engineer them. They would sell them to Iran. They'd sell them to China for a lot of money. And then they would reverse engineer them. And China's known for reverse engineering everything and creating mm. their mm. versions of whatever it's, whether it's a tank, jet, helicopter, gun, or mm -hmm. whatever sort, you know? 
Mm. So they basically, like the war's basically lost on the Western side because all the weapons that they they basically made their, their modern weapon and their modern technology. Mm -hmm. It's all like the blueprints are all in the hands of like the Eastern countries. And now they've created their own pack, which is like called the BRICS. Mm. So it's pretty much like impossible for them to actually like win from like, from a logical point of view. I have another angle on things where Britain is one of the biggest arms dealers. Oh yeah. And you get to try all new weapons in war. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, that's also another good point. And and I believe that they are happy to allow this thing to run its course because big business, as in arms, weapons, BAA, yeah, can try out all these new things and drones. Oh yeah, exactly. So you've got infantry drones now. You've got those robotic carriers that carry ammunition, that like the dog kind of creatures that yeah. follow you behind. And all that, so they can test it out and see how effective or ineffective it is in war. Exactly. And it's none of it's at their expense. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it's been really interesting talking to you. Yeah. Really interesting talking to you. We wish you well on everything you're going to be doing. Thank you. We hope that episode enhanced your life. We post an interview every day as well as vlogging on our social media channel. Don't forget to subscribe to get our latest episode.